Hello everyone and welcome. It's me, that Samoan guy. In case you didn't see my last video, you know, because you're not subscribed, like, comment, subscribe! I wasn't feeling too good in that video, so I had to cut the review short. But I didn't want to take too long to finish it, so I decided to have this part be an all audio review. I'll try to have some visual aids for you guys. Those are my favorite kind. Anyway, I stand by my initial statement that the Attack on Titan movie is generally pretty good. Most of the changes made were fine, the effects were good, and it's probably the best live action adaptation of an anime ever made. But when you really stop to think about it, you know, considering the ones we've had so far, the ones that were stupid, boring, or racist, that's not really that big of a compliment. They all had some kind of major flaw to it, and the Attack on Titan movie seems to keep that trend going. There's some pretty big problems with it, and I wanted to take a couple of minutes and discuss it with you all. Again, I'm sorry I'm not feeling all that great for this review. The doctor gave me some pills, and he said one of the side effects was being brutally honest with people. And I thought that was perfect. We need to be brutally honest with this movie and address all the things that are wrong with it so that when we go forward with any others, we can hopefully learn from these mistakes and make it a good movie. Sometimes I slap my penis to make it pee. Oh wait, did I say that? I, uh, how do I go back? Number one, why do they make live action movies out of my aminase? Before we get started, I think we should maybe talk about the general state of live action adaptations of anime movies. Don't worry, this won't take long. Right off the bat, I want to make sure we're all on the same page that anime is not a genre. Horror is a genre. Comedy is a genre. Action, suspense, porno. These are all genres of film. Similarly, TV shows and books are also not genres. They are a medium, a very specific viewpoint of an art form. But a lot of people tend to just shrug off amine uh, as a genre. But you see, there's all kinds of different amines out there. You got little kitty stuff, action, comedies, horrors, suspense, porno. There's all kinds of different genres of amines. So you see, it's just another medium like books and movies. And they've been adapting books and TV shows into movies for years now. It's not really all that shocking that they try to make an anime into a movie. But when you look at the anime movies that are out now, and you ask yourself why they keep trying despite the fact that, you, you know, that they suck, you're probably looking for a bit more of a deeper, more philosophical answer. Well, I got the answer for you, but I don't think you're gonna like it, so I'm not gonna say it out loud. But I'll tell you that it rhymes with... You see, whenever something makes a lot of money and gets super popular, inevitably movie talk starts to come up. It's a condensed, two-hour version of an otherwise long story that some people aren't willing to commit to. Especially nowadays when we're so overset, over, overset, overshattered with so many shows, it's hard to keep track of them all. Also, Attack on Titans and Nanomize, when people are often too timid or lazy to try out something new. They want the same shit that they got last time. Anybody want a piece of roll? Whether it originated from a book or an amine or a TV show or whatever, a movie version is attractive because it's meant to appeal to people outside the norm. Now consider the fact that we're talking about Attack on Titan, one of the most successful fucking anime shows ever since Toy Story. It was trending on social media every night that it was on. There were Pizza Hut commercials and car commercials, reaction videos all over the internet, merchandising. I mean, do you guys remember how quickly Netflix added Attack on Titan to its queue? They didn't even wait for their monthly announcement or whatever the hell they do that they think they're so important. In fact, they added it so fast they didn't even get the subtitles right and they uploaded the episodes out of order. So it really shouldn't be all that surprising that they decided to make an Attack on Titan movie. In fact, a lot of people were ungrateful with all the precautions they were taking with this movie. They had the author of the original source material involved. 
They mixed practical effects with CGI effects to avoid failing as fucking miserably as western movies do. The problem with this is that fans are fucking entitled, pissy, and sarcastic whiny babies that don't want their precious story changed too much. They're not able to take a step back and look at the more objective view of things. They want the exact same thing told in the exact same way but in a movie. It's all about balance. You must gain balance within yourself before you can bring balance to the world. Speaking of The Last Airbender, we should probably address the elephant in the room. By elephant, I mean racist. Number two, the race card. When the Dragon Ball movie came out, people complained because they had a white guy playing the character of Goku. When the cast list and the character posters for the Attack on Titan movie came out, everyone complained in pretty much the exact same way. See, originally Attack on Titan is set in a vague, undisclosed European location and all the characters over a vague European descent. They've all got German or Swedish last names. Rainer Braun, Jan Kirstein, Sasha Braus, Eren Yeager. They got blonde hair and blue eyes. And the architecture is all strikingly similar to something that you might see when you go backpacking up the hills of Tibidabo. I think it's Tibidabo. Okay, do you want to tell the story? Shut up, I'm talking. But you say no. You can't just have all the characters change from Germany or, or Sweden or, or Finland or France or, or whatever to being Japan. That's racist. Which, when you stop and think about it for a minute, is that yellow washing? You know, because the color of their skin is... Oh, I, I just... I just been advised not to finish the end of that sentence. What was I talking about? Oh, right. But see, like, the movie's made in Japan, so... Why wouldn't it have Japanese actors in it? The fact is that nobody goes to Japan to get into the movie business. You go to Hollywood to get into the movie business. People come from all over the world to learn about filmmaking and acting and Hollywood. Therefore, Hollywood has a pretty wide gamut of actors to choose from when it comes to casting characters of different races. They got all the resources and the money to do it, too. Japan works a little differently than that. Nobody flies to Japan to break into the movie business. Everybody has to just work with what they're given. And unfortunately, Japan's only given Japanese actors. Sure, you could outsource it, but that starts to get really expensive. See, this is why it's racist for a Western movie to do it. Because they actually have the resources and the actors to choose from, so that they don't have to make everyone white, but they do it anyway. Japan doesn't really have a say in the matter. I honestly believe that if they had the European actors to choose from to cast for the Attack on Titan movie, they definitely would've. But everybody's gotta work with what they're given. I mean, just look at me. I'm working with what I was given. I'm sick and on drugs and I'm still doing my review. My landlord says that I can live here rent free if I suck his toes twice a week. But wait, what? Number three, Aaron Yeager. Everything about Aaron is wrong in this movie. And I should point out that when I say wrong, I'm not talking about what's different. I mean that the character is written poorly and inconsistently and the actor doesn't know how to portray the emotions that the scene calls for. He never seems to be able to find an emotional middle ground where we as an audience can relate to what he's going through, or at least understand what he's going through. It's always one extreme end of the emotional spectrum, or the other. Either he has a blank slate for a face and we can't tell what he's thinking, or he's trying way too hard to the point where a dramatic scene starts to become comical. Yes, it could entirely be that the actor is just not particularly good at his job. But after thinking about it for a little while, I think it goes a little deeper than that, because honestly, I can't remember much about the character at all now that I'm thinking back on it. I hate to refer to Screenwriting 101 when talking about this movie, because it kind of makes it sound like the writers and the director don't really know what they're doing. But the writers and directors of this movie don't know what they're doing. Let's have a little Screenwriting 101 exercise, shall we? See, if you ever find yourself writing a script for a movie, and you're introducing a new character into a scene, whether it's the main character or a side character, two things need to happen very quickly. Introduction and establishment. The introduction is simply just fact-based information. Things you could see on their ID card if they had one. Name, origin, age, occupation, things like that. 
Cassandra Anderson, 21. Born in a block 100 meters from the radiation boundary wall. At age seven, she lost both parents to residual fallout cancer. Establishment's a little more complicated than that, especially when you're writing a script. Establishment is where we learn who the character is as a person. How they think, how they react to things, their personality. Are they sunny and optimistic? This could be our destiny, our fate. Or are they a sarcastic buzzkill? Miguel, if I believed in fate, I wouldn't be playing with loaded dice. The best way to establish a character is through actions, through showing it rather than telling it. But there's always exceptions to that rule. Just as an example, let's take a look at Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, and the moment when the audience meets Han Solo. Han Solo, I'm Captain of the Millennium Falcon. Chewie here tells me you're looking for passage to the Alderaan system. Right off the bat, we know his name, his job, and why he's important to our main characters. This is the introduction. Then, immediately afterwards, an old ex-boyfriend comes up and starts to stir up trouble. This is the establishment scene, where the audience sees that Han Solo is a smooth-talking, wisecracking thug with a bit of a rocky past. The audience is suddenly in doubt about whether or not our main characters can really trust him or not. He's also shown to be extremely calm under pressure because he starts to put together a plan while he has a gun pointed in his face. Sorry about the mess. God, he's so fucking sexy. Oh, did I just say that out loud? This was even in the original show, too. Right off the bat, Aaron is introduced and established as having problems with authority, angry spurts of violence. Then as the plot progresses, we see that Aaron is a character that sees the world in black and white. Titans are bad, humans are good, and that's it. No gray areas, middle grounds, or discussion to be had. The philosophical and moral conflict in the story arises when Aaron is forced to face gray areas and discovers that there are humans who are just as fucking evil and dirty as titans, and discovers that he himself is a gray area when he's able to turn into a titan. As the story progresses, he battles the morality of there being bad in good and good in bad or a yin-yang effect, if you will. This gives the character both a moral and physical confrontation to overcome in the form of Annie, who is herself both human and Titan. See, even though Attack on Titan has a very basic and bare-bones story, facets like this add depth to the character and give meat to the story. Movie Aaron has nothing. There's a nice moment in the beginning where he compares himself to a bomb. Stuck in the dirt, not going anywhere, and ready to explode. But then from that point on, he's not really motivated to do a whole lot of things. He doesn't even really emote all that much. Without spoiling anything, there's a moment where he was reunited with a character that he thought was dead. And his face is pretty much just this. In fact, if I didn't know any better, I'd say that this guy originally wanted to read for the part of Levi. But you can only blame an actor so much for a bad character. Remember, they can only work with what they're given. Do you, do you get it? I, I was doing like a thing. Speaking of callbacks, do you guys remember when I said that the director doesn't know what he's doing? Number four, the director doesn't know what he's doing. The director of this movie, who, I'm just going to put it right here, has never really done an action horror type movie before. Sure, some of them are a little similar in tone, I guess. And generally speaking, the direction's done pretty well in the movie. However, as the movie went on, I started to notice a bunch of little things that seemed to indicate that the director doesn't exactly know how to handle an action type, horror, monster type movie. But like, what are these examples? It would be really helpful and beneficial if you could list out each and every example and they go into excruciating detail about how they support your initial claim. Well don't worry, that's exactly what we're gonna do. You fucking asshole. The very first indication I noticed comes pretty early on. The camera cuts back and forth between Aaron and Mikasa. And then it does it again. And then again. And then one more time. The audience understands that they're looking at each other. You don't need to cut to it five, six fucking times already. We're paying attention to the movie. You don't need to keep showing it like we're not watching the movie. I initially just kind of shrugged this off and thought it was a little strange, but didn't pay it too much of a mind. But then it happened again. And again. 
The point is that it kills the tension. Experienced directors know exactly how long to hold those moments for, and they work closely with their editors because they need to communicate the importance of that tension. Instead of just holding on this, I'd pan them in, because remember, they're running. Yeah. They're running, so just take them down one of those aisles and just pan them into this frame. The simplest and most basic example I can think of of how to do this right is a classic cowboy shootout scene when they do some kind of a draw at sunset or whatever. The tension is held for just the right amount of time that the audience is waiting for it, and then kabooms, shablamos, kabooms. But if I were to take that same scene and take the part where they're waiting and cut it, and then repeat it three times over and make it three times longer than it needed to be, it kills the tension and the audience gets bored. This happens numerous times in the Attack on Titan movie, and I realize that this is kind of nitpicking, but all these instances and a couple more add up to support the case that the director is a little inexperienced with this particular kind of movie. Holding that tension and cutting back and forth is supposed to be the foreplay to what will ultimately build up to the climax. But if you focus on the build-up for too long, all that foreplay is going to amount to nothing because the climax can't possibly deliver and she's fallen asleep. Oh wait, we're still talking about movies, right? Number 5. Well, that's convenient. A lot of the writing in the Attack on Titan movie is convenient for convenience purposes. Out of nowhere, there's a thief that takes exactly what the characters need. It's never been foreshadowed or set up in any kind of way. Nope, just happens. Hey, a character hears some baby crying out in the middle of nowhere and completely ignores the fact that no one else hears the voices and doesn't want to go into the dark room where there's probably nothing but death waiting for you. Conveniently so that we can get an action scene because it's been about 20 minutes since the last action scene. We gotta keep the audience awake. Hey, you guys remember that character poster that had a guy with an axe on his shoulder or whatever? That whole character is nothing but convenience. Without giving too much away, this guy is really good at one particular thing. Then at the end of the movie, for no reason whatsoever, when all the characters are relying on him, he can't do it. When literally he's done the exact same thing two other times before. Conveniently so that Aaron has to be the one to jump in and save the day. Oh right, Aaron's the main character. Um, I guess. This is teetering dangerously into the, well, we gotta give this guy something to do, range. And honestly, when you find yourself writing a moment to give a character something to do, y you know, some kind of busy work during a scene, you should probably reevaluate why you're writing that scene, or if you even really need that character. Also, there's a scene where Hanji is teaching the soldiers about how to kill titans. She's got a little, like, plastic titan model thing set up so that she can point out the weaknesses. Wow. That's awfully convenient to have, Hanji. I'm glad you guys decided to set up those Titan model factories everywhere. You built them awfully quick, too, considering how everyone didn't even believe in Titans until two years ago. I mean, did we really have to have a physical thing for Hanji to interact with? You couldn't have just drawn it out on a chalkboard and just pointed and said, here, the Titans look like people. You couldn't have called up for a volunteer and just point at the back of the neck and say, Jid, just go for that thing. Now sure, all these things are just little tiny nitpicks that don't really tear the whole movie down as a whole, but I haven't even gotten to the worst one. The colossal one, if you will. Now for some reason, the writers of this movie decided to make it so that there's a law against inventing things. Then in the first two minutes, some stupid little kid waves up to Armin telling him that he invented the thing. Right then and there, Armin should have been either arrested or killed. But we'll just blow past that for now. You know, for convenience. But seriously, why is inventing things so bad? But she say, well, hold on there, just one minute. This is only part one. You haven't even seen the part two yet. For all you know, they're setting up something that hasn't been delivered yet. And this will come back in a big way once you see the second part. If I read that in the comments section, I'd have to pinch my penis to make sure I wasn't dreaming, because that would actually be a pretty reasonable response. So you know what? Let's explore this a little. I'll give you the benefit of the doubt and say that the whole law against invention thing hasn't come into play yet because we haven't seen part two. This is merely the setup to what will ultimately be a nice plot point in the second one. 
I'd like to take this time to remind everyone that in the movie's plot, the Scout Regiment or the Survey Corps or whatever you want to call it doesn't exist when the movie first starts out. It's not until the Titans get into the city and start eating people up that they form the Scout Regiment, basically in response to the giant attack. This makes way more sense than in the anime and the manga, where the Scout Regiment has been running for years and for no reason the government keeps funding it. So there was a long time of peace, no Titans got into the city, there's a law against inventing things, and then the Titans break through and start killing people. Two years later, the Scout Regiment is formed together. So then how did they invent the 3D maneuver gear if inventing things is illegal? The point I'm trying to make is that convenient writing is lazy writing. When things feel convenient in the writing of your movie, it feels manufactured and forced. You gotta think things through a little more thoroughly than not at all. Just look at me, I gotta think about where to put the bodies after I'm done with them. Number six, I'm done. So I think that's pretty much it. If you lay it all out and you have the Death Note movies as examples of what happens when you don't change enough, and on the other end you get the Airbender movie from changing everything, the Attack on Titan movie falls somewhere in the middle. Even though I made an explicit point to talk about the inconsistent writing and the inexperienced directing, I still firmly believe that if the main character was something more that we could relate to and actually remember after watching the movie, the rest of it wouldn't really matter. Some of the greatest films in history have plot holes and moments of poor direction. But we love them anyway. People can generally forgive technical misgivings and things from behind the scenes if the characters are real enough that we can care about them and start to relate to them. Not only was Aaron a more interesting protagonist than the original on his own, but he also helped to contrast all the surrounding characters around him. The Attack on Titan movie is pretty much what you get if you wanted to have Levi as your main character. And while I still defend all the good things that I had to say about the movie in the first part of the review, it's still not perfect. So if anyone ever says that they weren't really a big fan of the Attack on Titan movie, eh, I guess I could kind of see that. I'm still looking forward to seeing the second one and seeing how things ultimately wrap up. I'll be going in with some tempered expectations though, but I'll still try to keep an open mind about it. We all should. Just because they make changes to this original source material that you like so much doesn't mean that it's gonna be bad. It should be different. If you like the things in the original source material more, it'll always be there. No one will take it from you. New things help to challenge us and help us to grow a little more. They challenge our way of thinking a little bit, and we get to see things from a new perspective that you might not have even thought of before. Just like with this movie, we got to see what would have happened if our main character was a boring, emotionless, flaccid, empty-faced, blanket, forgettable, unmotivated, confused, creepy weird psychopath instead of an actual three-dimensional character that took the initiative and made decisions, moving the plot forward in an exciting and exhilarating way. So I think that's pretty much it. Like, comment, and subscribe.